Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight, where we look at what's really going on in the world of the Bricks. Now, it's well known that the United States politicians love imposing sanctions on other countries. And their favourite weapon, well, apart from invading countries that annoy them, fermenting coloured revolutions or implementing regime change in places that are not doing what the USA wants them to do. I mean, the USA even has a law that enacted called the Countering of American Adversaries Abroad, which is really a catch-all law that allows the US to impose sanctions or attack any country that it pleases. I mean, recently an advisor of Donald Trump put forward a proposal that any countries that are implementing de-dollarization plans should be punished, and given that's one of the aims of the BRICS, is it likely that the US will sanction the BRICS? Well, certain BRICS members are already under sanction, as you know, they are Russia and Iran. The US is also important, uh, imposing certain trade sanctions on China. It's also threatening secondary sanctions against companies and other BRICS members like China, India and the United Arab Emirates for trading with Russia. Well, given the schizophrenic nature of the US foreign policy, I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, the US imposing sanctions on the BRICS. But now let's look at the US sanctions policy. Now, the sanctions imposed by the US on a significant number of countries are not solely intended to exert political pressure on those who oppose Washington. An expert in the field has discovered after discover, uh, studying US Treasury Department data that they've become a fundamental part of the US economy, which without it, we wouldn't function normally. I mean, the US is the most active country in the world in the f terms of punishing others. According to the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, every third country in the world is subject to some form or another of American sanctions. In total, the US implements three times more sanctions regimes than all other countries or international organizations combined, and that includes the United Nations. This shows that the United States is engaged in a continuous economic and trade conflict with over a third of the global population. I mean, according to the US Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Control, the current administration has introduced the highest number of new sanctions in history. I mean, since Joe Biden took over, approximately 3,500 legal entities and individuals around the world, and that's excluding Russia, have been subject to new trade restrictions. In this regard, the Biden administration has significantly inceded the sanctions imposed by the Donald Trump administration. During the Trump administration, uh, only 2,500 entities were subject to sanctions. And in comparison, Trump introduced sanctions more frequently than Barack Obama. He only introduced 1,000 restrictions, and he was uh, more than George W. Bush, who was actually only just under 1,000. In fact, in the past 30 years, the most relaxed administration has been that of Bill Clinton. During his term in office of two terms, he only had 500 foreign companies subject to sanctions. Now, a comparison of these figures demonstrates that the level of sanctions activity pursued by the United States is not influenced by the political affiliation of the administration in power. I mean, this change in the political party and the control of the White House has no significant impact on its sanctions policy. Now, this is evidenced by an examination of the entire history of the United States, according to Valerie Senkov, uh, who's head of the Department of Economic Security at the Russia State University. Now, before I continue, I'd like to make an appeal. If you like and enjoy my videos, you can help me fund the channel and my website, seobricksinsight.com, and to further develop it. You can do this by making a small donation, which is done by clicking on the thanks button at the bottom of the video screen. Everybody who donates does get a personal thank you from me, and I'm thanking you all now in advance for, for watching and for uh, supporting me. Now, in 2022, Columbia University published a paper, How Sanctions Are Changing the World Against U.S. Interests. I mean, the study demonstrated that the United States sanctions policy has now become uh, obsolete and uh, not working. I mean, the restrictions are introduced as a universal tool, which has actually reduced their effectiveness. I mean, it's important to recognize that any conflict not only has a direct effect, but also a delayed effect. And this is 
equally applicable to sanctions. Now, the number of foreign companies against which Washington imposes restrictions is, continues to rise. According to the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies, as of July 2024, uh, U.S. sanctions apply to companies and governments in more than 60% of the countries in the world. Now, the majority of these countries are, uh, are classified as emerging market. And it's not possible to offset this trend by lifting some of the sanctions. That's just not going to happen. I mean, in 2016, during the final months of Barack Obama's tenure in the Oval Office, the White House implemented the most significant amnesty on sanctions to date. They uh, did approximately 1,500 uh, companies were actually removed from the blacklist. And that was the only positive outcome regarding sanctions uh, since 1996. I mean, sanctions are allegedly a soft approach for the United States to pursue in order to affect changes in the political landscape of foreign countries. But this is only one aspect of the situation, the public aspect. I mean, sanctions are often presented to the public uh, as a policy of bloodless alternative to forceful me measures of uh, international relations. But it's well, less well known that it become a significant factor in the American economy, I mean, it's generating a multi-billion dollar turnover. I mean, due to the extensive level, the network of lobbyists representing the interests of American companies, who look at restrictions against foreign companies and legal entities are factor in part of their competitive dynamics. Just look at the US LNG industry against Russia. I mean, the political motives are just merely a facade. If an American company needs to cooperate or attack a firm from a friendly country, this company is willing to turn a blind eye to all the sins of the government and use whatever powers it can. I mean, the optimal scenario is when the competitor is in need of weakening base in a country with unfavourable political regime. I mean, there's the, the list of Venezuela, Iran, North Korea, Cuba and Russia. However, analysts have highlighted the benefit of these sanctions for the United States are not immediately apparent. I mean, what do they get out of it? I mean, it's not as if North Korea has not continued to develop its missile and nuclear technology. Russia and Iran have explored their options for parallel imports, developed shadow fleets for their oil exports, and identified other measures to circumvent all the sanctions. I mean, as of April 2024, 15,400 legal entities and uh, individuals worldwide were under US sanctions, 12,000 in Russia, Switzerland only sanctioned 5,000, Canada 4,292, and the UN only 875 entities. That's the UN. I mean, the Biden administration has been a notable increase in the number of voices in the US expressing concern that they become overly focused on sanctions. I mean, to the extent they're now having the unintended consequences of creating the backlash, those with the critical view, including within the US Treasury itself, are highlighting that the sanctions are frequently imposed without due consideration and gives a chaotic and ineffective approach. I mean, they highlight that the US is witnessing a series of unintended consequences from sanctions, including the strengthening of the alliance between Moscow and Beijing, the growth of uh, trade uh, and the de-dollarization. There's also mounting discontent among US allies about the risk of being subject to secondary sanctions, which is why they're all looking to de-dollarize their national economies just like the BRICS. I mean, in March 2016, the White House advisor Jack Lew cautioned that an overdose of sanctions was undermining the efficiency of their foreign policy. I mean, sanctions have always been and will remain a tool, regardless of the ideological motives, but being comparable to the use of military force and economic pressure to others that have a similar objective, it does seem that the US is not very good at using all three of them. I mean, Valery Senkov notes that there's 17 UN sanctions regimes and 37 EU sanctions regimes globally, with 14 of those directed at Russia. And yet Russia's uh, economy is booming and the others are not. I mean, if the current trend of annual increases in sanctions continues under the US, next US president, 
it's likely that most major companies in the world will be subject to sanctions, either primary or secondary, and these include targeted sectoral export control, financial, cyber, and other types of sanctions. It's worth noting that counter-sanctions are typically imposed to response to sanctions, like the Russians did with the food embargo on the EU. And that leads to a significant disruption to the trade. I mean, it's useful to consider the example of medicine. I mean, medicines are effective in appropriate dosage, but it becomes toxic when you take too much of it. I mean, American analysts have noticed that calls alone cannot halt the sanctions overdose, as long as the US policymakers and politicians can see that it benefits them and they get their, their donors to pump up their... Uh, uh, her campaign funds. I mean, George Lopez, an expert on sanctions at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, and believes that decisions on sanctions have been taken beyond the control of politicians are now controlled by lobbyists, uh, which proliferate in Washington, and they're facing increasing challenges. I mean, American firms have now increased legal actions against OFAC, seeking reverse the decisions to impose restrictions on some of their foreign counterparties. I mean, please note the following detail. The uh, OFAC office is actually not a whole department, but just a small room within the US Treasury Department building. And it was not designed for a level of sanctions, so it can't obviously cope with the ones that have been done. Now, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, you can help me fund the channel and the website seobricksinsight.com by clicking the thanks button at the bottom of the screen. Thank you and good night.